Okay, you guys, hello out there in YouTube land. Why does that video, why, okay, we get to make all our mistakes right now. I don't know why my music is it's not supposed to be playing there. Hang on a second. I'm not going to have it play through the whole dang thing here. Boom. There it Okay, that's a little hot. Yeah, isn't it? Okay, I got to turn this off. Yeah, you guys, you are the lucky few who get to see all the stuff behind the scenes. As I fumble around and try to find my way to whatever is going on here. Okay, well, hey, you guys. So keep shouting out wherever you're from. I love it. So... SK, I don't know where you're from. Leon, you're from Massachusetts. We love Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got, mean, uh, whoa, I've, no way. We got a Mekong River checking in. Whoa. Dang, man. And we got, Mass for some reason, Romania and Massachusetts, which are exactly alike. Only <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Different. Completely different. We're kind of <laughs> covering the whole globe here, the Mekong Delta. That's wow. we're, what we're triangulating. We've got Romania, the yeah. Mekong River, and we have Massachusetts. And somehow they're all connected today for some some weird reason. South Florida. There we go. I love myself some Dade County. And Fleming Bo Jensen, did you go up in the SpaceX rocket? I mean, hey, that's kind of cool. I, He's... Um, He's got. He uses the force. He's he's definitely a Jedi. Um, by yeah, the way, the SpaceX the SpaceX was incredible. I have to say. Was it? Oh, well, Channel well. Islands, right on. We got Chicago Land. Latisha from L.A. Netherlands. Portugal. Wow, I love it. Italy. Man, Portugal. Portugal's high on my list. I got to get there at some point. Absolutely. Channel I gotta get Islands. There. The Natty's checking in as well. I love Cincinnati. I was born in Indiana. My mom's from Ohio, so uh, that's the old stomping ground. Budapest, Dubai, San woo, San Vietnam. Lorenzo. I became well, we're, a photography, photographer because of the Vietnam War, even though I was not, I was too young to be involved in any way. That's what influenced me. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't. I, I managed to get a, a high lottery number, and that's why I didn't go there. Thank goodness. Otherwise, wow. I would have found another way out, believe me. Um, it was a tough one. It was a tough Florida. one. Florida. Florida coming in. Two different people from Florida, Miami and Florida. Okay, well, My listen, you guys. My grandparents used to live in Marco, and uh, I love South Florida. It's uh, it's one of the best photographic destinations in the U.S. by far, the most interesting. Great light. It lots, is. Lots to love about South Florida and the NY. The NY. You, you can't deny the NY. It's good to see the NY like taking take that, take yeah. that curve over COVID. It's nice to see. I yeah, know it's well fine. done, no, you guys. It's gone, but it's moving in the right direction. Perhaps let's keep our fingers crossed. Absolutely. Well, listen. Let me go Long ahead and official. Beach, California, one of Long... the best cycling cities in America, by the way. One of the only cities that has their minds right. Boulder, Long Beach. Portland, I never would have guessed. Long Beach, California. I know. And guess what? The new the new kid on the block is Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Well, that's take it from a cyclist. Okay, I better get this party officially started. So I'm going to do the formal stuff here. And hello, you guys. It's Mark Silber in Carmel, California. <laughs> you should know by now that I'm an author and a photographer. And I want to let you know, if you don't already know, let's get our screens going here. So today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. I love these guys. They will make any kind of print for you, whether it's a metal print, uh, a book, a coffee cup, Anything you want, cards, they are awesome. They give excellent customer service. They're great friends of mine. And they will give you a 25% discount for your first order. So take advantage of that and get out there and get some stuff made and show it to the world. Well, you guys already know this, but our friend Dan Milner is joining us again. He is a documentary photographer and the creative evangelist for Blurb. He loves to strip away and blow to pieces false beliefs, myths, and other things. So Dan, 
welcome back to Advancing Your Photography. Always good to have you here. Thank you for having me. I love the chat. I have to say I love the live chat and I love I to see people coming in. We just had France check in. We've got Oregon checking in. We've got Long Beach. We've got all these places. It's pretty cool. Um, can, just a real quick mic check. Everybody hear me okay? Give I me a, can give hear me a heads you. Up if you, can, you can hear me okay? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, it's been busy here in the, uh, in the high desert, in the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And uh, I've been swamped with work cranking out films, doing all kinds of stuff. I got out to do some filming for a day, which was pretty fun. I hadn't done that in two and a half months, which was great. I was very isolated, by the way. I was in the middle of nowhere, so there were no people. There was no nothing. I did No distractions. Filming, no distractions. You know, it's hard when, you're, when you have to cover a huge distance, and then you have to record audio, shoot stills, record video, make sure your sound is right, think about story, write a script. The day goes really fast. Like a 12-hour day is just the starting point, and then you're into the 15, 18, 20-hour days kind of thing. So, okay, Mike is good. Uh, okay, we're good. So should we just dive in and start busting? So I got a couple of them, but why don't you fire away first of all? And I, hey, by the way, I have, uh, if you need them, I have your uh, website open with your photos in it. If you want to show an example, I also have the ones you sent over before. Just shout out if you want me to post something up here and we can talk about it. But okay. what's your first, um, what's the first one you want to fire away at? What's the first myth? So the first myth, I don't remember because I'm too busy to remember what I did two weeks ago or the last time. We Doesn't did one matter. Day. I, I might have, I might have already done this one, but there's a caveat. I Bust want to, it again. I want to end it. Because I get this question literally every week, and I'm, I'm, I'm not tired of answering it, actually. I think it's a totally valid and legit question. But the myth is it's better to be a professional photographer than a hobbyist, right? So, but wait. Yeah. Wait till the very end of what I'm going to say. Because the myth is, you know, I got to go pro. I got to go pro. I got to go pro. And so the reason I'm bringing it up this week is I had a conversation a couple of days ago with a photographer who had just told me that they had shown work to a magazine. And so when I came up in photography, the newspaper was the training ground, and then the, but the magazine world was sort of the promised land. That's where I wanted to be, the editorial world. And I got there, and I realized pretty quickly it was not really the world that I had dreamed it to be. So I departed after about five years and went and did other things. But I know it still holds a – it holds a hold – it has a hold on photographers in a very specific way. So this photographer says to me last week, hey, I just showed work to a magazine and was getting feedback from the photo editor from the magazine. And it's a very big magazine. It's very well known. But I said to the, the guy who was showing work, I said, well, let me, let me ask you a few questions. What's the, what's the pay scale that they're going to pay you, right? Because they're still, this magazine is still paying rates that they were paying in the 1970s. That's Literally, remarkable. The How do they do that? And, oh, by the way, they do because there's enough people out there willing to work for those rates. I mean, yeah. if you look at some of the biggest news organizations in the U.S., their pay scale is literally – it's not even poverty level. It's way below. So my first question was, what yeah. are you going to pay? He didn't know, but I can guarantee you it's, it's those day rates from 1970. Two, I said, how long are they going to take you to pay you? My guess was three months minimum, six months more likely. Oh, that's, that's terrible. If you, that's if you hound them. Number three, do they make you sign a work for hire contract? My guess is yes, because they want to own your content. Point number oh. four is are they going to embargo your work for three months if they run any of it? Point number five is are they going to give you any space to really tell the story? My guess, no. So he, his eyes were kind of like saucers because you're thinking, oh, on the surface, it's going to look really sexy and romantic if I get published in this magazine. But in actuality, you might actually be going backwards financially and your career might be going backwards if you have any engagement with them whatsoever. So yeah. it's a deceptive world. So I am living proof that life sort of outside the professional full time photography space is a very, very rich environment in my I would never go back. Right. Once I quit in 2010, I started getting opportunities I didn't have before. However, my caveat in the way I will end this myth bust is that there are people out there listening to what I just said who are not deterred in the slightest. They're looking at me and saying, I don't care what you say. I'm going to be a professional photographer. And so if you're those, if you're one of those people, you are the only ones who have a chance because you have to want it more than you can possibly imagine. 
to do the battles every day to win the photo war, you have to battle every single day. And so there are people out there who are never going to be dissuaded. It's in their DNA, their blood. They will find a way to get it done. And for those of you, I tip my hat. But I think in general, for a lot of people, especially in the online space, there's the idea of what it means to be a professional, and then there's the reality, and they are very, very, those worlds are very far apart. Let me add a, a caveat to that, too. You know, uh, I think that we should define what it means to be a professional photographer. It is somebody who either... Hang on, Marquito. Marquito, yeah. everyone's saying, everyone's saying they get, you got to turn my mic up. Okay. Say something again here, and let's just adjust it. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, I mean, on, that mic up. I don't understand it because over here it's showing you're almost peaking. So um, turn your mic up. Okay, well, I will. I'm going to turn them up. Let me know if this is better. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to address this point. What is a professional photographer? I think we should really clearly define that because you are talking about a specific role as professional as a pro. But one could do things. You are still a professional photographer. You're working, you're using your work and getting paid for it in a different way, though. And I am, for instance, publishing my books with my photographs in it. I have uh, many friends like um, Bob Holmes, who does specific assignments, but they're all under his own control. But he's professional because he's producing high quality professional work. I think we want to encourage people to do that. It's a question of, do you sell yourself out? And your point is, do your due diligence. Don't just sign on to something because it sounds sexy. Find out if it really is a good opportunity or not. And that only comes from due diligence, right? You got to check yeah, it out. Yeah, and I think your definition, you know, professional photography definition varies from the from the online photo world and then the actual industry. So when I say professional photographer, I mean someone who works full time and makes their living from shooting professional work. And that's either editorial, that's commercial, that's advertising, that's automotive, fashion, et cetera. But it's in the actual industry of photography. Yeah. The online photo community for a lot of people you know, getting likes on Instagram makes them a professional or getting a brand that takes something of theirs for free off of Instagram and posts it to them. That's a professional. So that's not the definition that I'm talking about. I'm talking about yeah. people who work full time as a photographer. And there are very, very, very few of those who are able to control their own destiny now. And the ones that, that I know that do are in their 50s, 60s and 70s. And they've been doing this for a long time. And so clients know if they want. And I, I heard Helmut Newton's wife talk in LA one time and it was mind blowing because she said, you know, when Helmut started, they were giving him assignments. And then after a while, they realized if they wanted the best work, they just should let him they'd let Helmut do what Helmut did. And so those days, I think I had a little bit of that when I came up there, I would get assignments and they would just say, you know, we like your work and we want you to, this is the, this is what the story is and the assignment is, but there was no construction outside of that. Now it, things are very different. And so most of the photographers that I know that are working are compromised in some way. And some people are totally fine by that. And other people are, you know, kind of frustrated and saying, well, I don't really feel like this is my work. But again, the subset of people who don't care, who are going to do it anyway, those are the ones that are going to make the great stuff because they're not going to be deterred. They're just going to say, look, I'm going to find a way to do it. And they're out there doing it right now. Bravo. And that really is a good lesson anyway, no matter what you're doing. You know, be the captain of your own ship whenever possible. Bottom line. All right, Dan, what's the next one? I got one ready to fire at you if, if uh, you want one from my end. But tell me what your next one is. You, you, have, a okay. little, you have a book that you're going to show us, too. Can we tie that into one of your... Was that tied kind into of. a myth? Okay. Yeah, okay. So... Um... I don't know. Maybe I talked about this one before either, but again, I just keep getting it all better. the time. So the myth of this is more is better, right? And now we can tie the book in because as you can see, this is a pretty small book. In fact, it's not a book. It's a magazine. Yeah. I did this a few years ago when I was traveling nonstop. Um, I was fascinated by Edward Snowden and I did a book called Whistleblower, a magazine called Whistleblower. And this is probably 20 pages total. And it's a very peculiar designed magazine where all of the images are completely high key 
So all you have is black and white. There's no grayscale. Yeah. yeah. And then, then there's a line on the left. There's copy on the left. You can't really see it, but the individual letters, most of the copies dark gray, but then individual letters are black. And those letters form a secret code word. So every page has an embedded secret code word in it. Like this was done in front of the Trade Center. And I was photographing in Australia and London and places like London where surveillance is a huge part of the culture. But it's a little 20 page magazine and it was fun. I didn't do it for anyone. I had no intention of selling it. It was not a portfolio piece. It was just a way of like when I was traveling for other reasons to just progress on something small along the way. I do this all the time. So it's rare that I travel or go anywhere where I don't have some small project going that I can add to every day. So when I went out two days ago, even though I was going out to film and do footage and sound and everything, I was shooting stills along the way to work on a project that I've been working on for a long time. And it just kind of, it's helpful because it makes you feel like you're making progress or you're making, you're having success, et cetera. It's a little mind game. Uh, but my point with this is that more, everyone thinks that more is better, right? More megapixels, more yeah. images, blah, blah, blah. But longer essence, lenses, longer, longer lenses. And the one point I want to make is, is the actual number of photographs that you make in the field. Now, if you're a sports photographer and you're shooting a camera now that shoots whatever, 12 frames a second or 15 frames a second, it's hard not to accumulate a lot of files. And, and peak action sports is one of those things that may require you to really you know, drag on that shutter for a while. But for the rest of us, especially if you're doing documentary work, those really amazing moments don't happen very frequently. And so the reason I'm saying this is I've had workshop students in the past where I watched them work in the field and in a single morning they might shoot 30 gigs of, of data and I was like wow that's you know shooting hundreds and hundreds of images from a scene and what happens is it the, the work suffers in the edit because and the, and the archive because you either have people that start throwing away their work and they go, well, I don't need to archive all these. And they toss away work that might actually better be better than what they kept because they just don't have space for it. And two, they get tired of looking at thumbnails on a laptop and they get sloppy. So shooting a, more images is definitely not necessarily a good thing. True that. Uh, you know, I've done assignments in the past where I shot like 40 rolls of film over a week's week period. And I was with people that shot hundreds of rolls of film in the same time frame. And it's a different philosophy about how you shoot. But I think, and that was in the film era where shooting, editing transparencies was very simple in comparison to digital files. So that's yeah. just a myth that I think is health, helpful to like, you don't need to go blast 10,000 images every day. True that. Let me throw out one. I was just thinking, you know, this is probably, and we've, we've, we've talked about this before. This isn't brand new. But, you know, if you're always on the search for the next piece of gear, you are going in the wrong direction. What you should be looking at is how can I use what I have? Now, I'm going to give you an analogy. I used to teach mountaineering. Every time you, you put on a new pair of boots, guess what? You got to break them in or you end up having blisters. They're stiff. They're uncomfortable. You've got this break-in period, which is really kind of a pain in the ass. Okay, so, you know, what if you were changing your shoes every day or every week or whatever? You would be constantly in the break-in period. And every time you pick up a new piece of equipment, don't get me wrong, I love new stuff, I love equipment. But if you're constantly throwing yourself into this state of having to relearn, get new muscle memory, you are going to be distracted by your equipment. Instead of knowing it, you're going to be distracted. You're on a carousel ride, which isn't a good place to be as a photographer. You're going to be spinning around. So a better point to adopt is take the equipment you've got and know it inside and out. Certainly you can add to it if you need to. You can change this or that. But don't, don't be looking for that next piece of gear to solve your problems as a photographer because you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, because you have to buy it and then you have to carry it. Got to carry it around and you and you got to learn it. It doesn't just pop out of the box and all of a sudden, oh, wow, I know, you know, I'm totally comfortable with this new camera. You, you got to go through a learning curve. There's new menus, there's new this and that. And 
And if you're constantly, I, unfortunately, our world tells us constantly, hey, we, if you just had this new model of this or that and you added this lens and you do, you know, you'd be a great photographer. The truth is the pros that I know have a very concise kit and they know how to use it. It's that simple. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of gear craziness, it exists in pretty much all the different uh, different Fields. subgroups of where I live my life. You know, photography, mm -hmm. I mean, I love to cycle. I love to hike. I love to fly fish. I love to do all these things. Like fly fishermen, if you're talking about gear, they're, they're maybe the craziest people you've ever oh, seen. Man. There's so much gear. But and cycling as well. And, and the thing is, you can either talk about it and you can acquire all this stuff or you can go use it. And I had a pretty funny conversation last week with someone who called me and we were talking about doing a ride later in the year, a hundred mile ride up in the mountains. And they said, you know, what's your average wattage? And I was like, I have no idea. And they go, well, what kind of power meter do you have? And I go, I don't have one. I've never had a power meter. They go, well, what's your average pace? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't keep track of it. And he goes, well, <laughs> what's the what's the gearing on your bike? Is it an 11, 36 or 38? And I go, I have no idea. And he goes, you've had that bike for 10 years and you don't know the gearing. And I go, no, all I do is point it and ride it. That's it. I love why do you, it why do you need to know those numbers, right? You don't. No idea. It's the yeah. quantification, that quantification of things. And I think, look, photographers historically have always been geeky, right? It's one of the reasons the art world yeah. always kind of poo-pooed the photo world because they're like, oh, they're just so enamored by how things were done. And yeah. I get it because it's the, the new equipment. Any kind, anytime there's an advancement in technology, look at the SpaceX. When they said that the part one of the rocket booster was going to return to Earth and land on a drone ship, I was like, there's no way. <laughs> you know, my com my computer crashes three times a day doing email. There's no way they can land a rocket on a drone ship. And then beep, it lands on the drone ship. And I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like that technology, I want to know about that technology. Not that I'm going to buy a SpaceX rocket, but I get it. So being enamored by photo equipment, it's a yeah. kind of a logical thing. But ultimately, you're going to be judged by your images. Elon Musk, you know, somebody brought this up. So let's dive into this one. This, you know, YouTube influencers and gear. I'm going to make a little you're going to think this is a bad statement for me to make. But you know what? It's you're bad. not, not going to learn photography by watching YouTube alone. You're not going to learn photography by even watching my channel alone. You're no. not going to learn. I know that's a stupid it's thing for me to say. But here's the deal, guys. You're not going to learn photography by watching YouTube. You you any more than you're going to learn to cook by watching a cooking show. You got to get out there and get the pans out and start cooking stuff. And that's the other part of the picture. You can get inspired, you can get a new whatever, you know, point of view, but if you don't go out and use it and shoot and learn from those photographs whether they're mistakes or not, you're not in the whole process of learning. You got to get out there and do it. And I think there's there can be an obsession just, you know, if I just keep watching this stuff and listening to these guys, maybe it'll all rub off on me. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that ain't going to happen. I just shot you know, myself funny. in the foot. No, I think I mean, look, it's the truth. You, you're not going to you can learn photography from YouTube, but you're only going to learn a very certain kind of photography and it's not going to be that deep. So the truth is you have to go figure out who you are as yeah. a photographer and YouTube ain't going to tell you that. And, you know, someone was asking a question about um, do you think it's the photo company sales pitch or YouTube influencers about photo gear personalities? The, the photo companies are like are like commercial fishermen with a gill net that's just dragging along the bottom, right? They're not selective about who they're going after. They're going after the masses because they're trying to move boxes, right? That's yeah. I get it. It's it's called you know commerce, but but photography is hard. You got to figure out who you are as a, as a human, and um, and then you got to figure out how you see the world that's different or what stories you want to tell. And I think also too, there's there's the, this is kind of something that infuriates people, especially like the gearheads. There is no right and wrong with photography. There's no right and wrong. It's not black and white. Oh, that picture's good. That picture's not good. It doesn't matter. It's yeah. it, there's so many other variables involved into what's good and what's bad. The truth is, you go out, you make yourself happy, you do good work, you treat the people you photograph with respect, and you keep building. You'll get better and better. That's right. You know, and and you can also go the other way. I mean, I used to shoot every day for years, and I was I was in what I would call I had photo fitness. Right, I was sharp. I would go in the field and I could instantly turn it on 
and I could engage with what I was doing and make good images. Now, because I rarely shoot and I, you know, and the pictures I do are done for a variety of different reasons, there may not necessarily be about great photography. It's harder. It takes me two or three days in the field with blocking out all the all the distractions to really be able to get back to that level. And it can be frustrating because for the first two or three days, I'm like looking at pictures I should have made yeah. and realizing I miss, I'm not good enough to get it yet. I have to sort of get back in my, my find my photo fitness again. You know, it's like going on any adventure, expedition or whatever. You know, I used to go on these expeditions. There were 30 days at a time, 30 days. And I do three of them every summer. So I'd be out 90 days at a time with a backpack. And those first few days could be a little tough and brutal. You got to get back into the groove, you know? You've gotten out of shape. The pack is super heavy. It's always heaviest at the beginning, which is kind of cruel and unusual. And maybe you've partied the night before. Not that I ever did this, you know, and started out hungover the first day out. Oh, boy, I could tell you some oh, stories. Oh, yeah. No, I can't imagine. We were wild mountaineering instructors. What do you think we did? We hit town, and we were like, shoot them up, man, Durango, Colorado. <laughs> we were like That's the Cowboys. That's a fun town. It's a fun town. There's a rodeo there in uh, uh, Fourth of July that was a lot of fun. And then we would beat ourselves up and mess ourselves up and then put on a huge heavy pack. And those first few days, Dan, it's just like you're saying, you got to get back in the groove again. Yes. It's, it's like that with anything, it's, anything you're really serious about. If you're going to dabble around and go on a, you know, a two hour walk, it doesn't really matter. But if you're, if you're serious about any sport and, well, let's call photography a sport. Cause it kind of is, I think it's yeah. better to regard it as a sport than, than any other way because really it's a game you're trying to tell a story you're trying to get your voice your your message out there and you've got and all these elements it's, and it's mental and physical you know i think it one is. of the things that i didn't know as a kid and believe me there were plenty of days when i went on assignments hung over from you know going crazy when i was younger i wasn't no. mountain climbing but i was doing assignments and i think it is as the older i got the more i realized i've got to stay in shape to do this kind of work. And I remember one of the first assisting jobs I ever had. I think I got the assisting job because I could keep up with a professional photographer on a golf course carrying a 400 millimeter lens. It was his second body with his giant 400 to eight. And we had to run his professional golf tournaments. And we had to run from hole to hole. And he, the photographer was in really good shape. And he was a runner from in his college era. And you know he looked at me, I think, and was like, okay, he's a runner, he can keep up with me. And so it is, it's much more physical than, than I think people think. But, um, so I have another myth and someone, Stephen, oh, you paid, let's, meant, let's address page. Cause it almost follows right along with you, what you were right, saying here. Go for it. Go for so it. how would you try to move to the professional space, intern with other photographers, try to freelance, et cetera. I mean, you were kind of answering that question right there, tagging along. So it, Interning is definitely on, a good way to go. It depends on the physical the physical space. Like, for example, if you're trying to be a fine art photographer, you would pay. This is directed to Torrance Page. You, if you're trying to be a legitimate like fine art photographer who's getting work in museums, working with galleries, having a collector base, that would require one path. If you're trying to be an advertising photographer, that would be another path. And let's say editorial would be a third path or even a fourth path could be I want to work for an NGO, like a non-government organization. I want to work in you know, refugee camps in Central Africa, whatever. So each requires a little bit of a different path. But one is understanding who are the serious players in those fields. Like if yeah. you're looking at if you're looking at fine art photography, someone like Terrence Simon is someone that you should study and know. That and, and the network of people around them. Michael Lundgren is another photographer, Arizona based fine art photographer who I really like. His work is fantastic. These are people you'd study. Same for NGO photography, same for advertising. Uh, if I was headed towards photography today, I would probably not go the photojournalism route that I did. I would not go the editorial route. I would either aim for advertising or I would aim for fine art. And when I say fine art, this is the slippery slope. I don't mean like landscape photo photographs online with a saturation slider at plus 25, right? <laughs> There's a whole crowd that says this is fine art photography. I'm talking about the actual industry of fine art, which, by the way, is fascinating. And it's yeah. well worth your time to investigate because a lot of what you're looking at is conceptual photography. And conceptual photography is like 
it's a hall pass to do anything you can possibly dream up. And I think it's probably the single most interesting genre of photography left is fine art and studying what these people have done. And I certainly never worked in that space. I'm by no means an expert on that space, but I know a lot of the big players. I know who they are and I know their work and it's intriguing. So I would go that route. And I know that's not a a detailed answer, but that's as best I can do right now. Thanks, Paige. That's a great question, by the way. It is. Okay. So you had, you were just about to pop off another one. Oh yeah. Another myth. Yeah. And I'm doing this one because Stephen mentioned Joel Sartore. So the myth is, oh, this is a good one. This is a really good one. I I can feel it, Dan. I'm feeling it. I'm sitting sitting down, but I'm going to sit down again. I'm even sitting down again. To be good, you have to be really serious. Oh, yeah. That is not true. So the case in point would be the brooding photojournalist always wearing black, has the scarf, very moody, resentful, concerned photographer, you know, everything is deathly serious, etc. Those those folks are out there. There's quite a few of them. But I'm going to counter those people with the likes of Martin Parr, Elliot Erwitt, Dwayne Michaels, and thanks to Stephen, Joel Sartori. Now, here's the thing. All of these people are very serious about their work. Right. They take they do serious projects. They're all they're all very highly regarded photographers. They do projects of all sorts. But when they are in person, I've met Joel Sartori many times. Uh, I've met Dwayne Michaels a, f- a few times and been able to, to have a few conversations with him. Elliot Erwitt, no, Martin Parr, no. But they have a sense of humor that is a, yeah. a huge part of who they are. I mean, you can't look at Martin parse photographs and not laugh you can't look at some of elliot erwitz and not laugh um i'm sorry someone's calling in like relentlessly um and Dwayne michaels is it really might be funny your mother in person no it was like a weird number i didn't know okay and Dwayne michaels is a is really funny as a human being so i think sometimes one of the things that i see happening is that photographers take themselves so seriously they kind of lose track of context and so i'll give you an example pretty much every christmas or, or Thanksgiving, I get a call from a photographer demanding something from me. Typically, it's sponsorship. You know, if, if you don't sponsor this project, I will blah, blah, blah. And when I say to them, do you realize it's Christmas Day? Or do you realize it's Thanksgiving? Often, they don't have a clue because they're so engrossed in their own little bubble, little world, that they've lost context with the rest of, the, of humanity. So, I always look at these guys, and I think Martin Parr, uh, Elliot Erwitt, Dwayne Michaels, Joel Sartori, these guys are such a breath of fresh air because their work is really good. It's legendary. Like Their work is legendary work, but they also have this incredible sense of humor. And even from the time I first got into photography – even, and I was doing like trying to do serious projects, and my, and my, my heroes were all the Magnum people. I always looked and thought there is a place for humor here. There has to be because the world needs humor. You know, we have to be able to laugh at ourselves here, here. We have to be able to laugh at a lot of things. So you don't necessarily have to be the super serious heavyweight person to get your objectives done or get your point across. Listen, I want to underscore that, you know, I have interviewed hundreds of photographers and I stay away from the quote serious ones because they're hard to interview. I have, I've, I've had one guest. I'm not going to say who this is, but he answered every question. He was so serious. His demeanor was so stern. Every question I asked him, he answered with one sentence. And I felt like I was lifting a heavy load through the whole thing. Here's a contrast. Ansel Adams was known for just creating laughter wherever he went. In fact, you could tell where he was in the building because you'd hear everybody laughing wherever he was. And as he moved through the gallery or whatever it was, there's more laughter. He was a fun loving guy. He took his photography seriously. I mean, he knew what he was doing, but man, he, he, I've been to his studio. He has some cool, funny things hanging on the wall. He doesn't take himself seriously or didn't. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the, the, it's I have such an appreciation for that. I'm thinking in my head, I've been to Palm Springs Photo Festival like 10 years of the 12, I think, or actually it's been going a lot longer than that. But I, wow. I typically go every year. 
And Dwayne Michaels was there. And I just remember watching the same thing. Wherever Dwayne Michaels went, people were laughing hysterically. And he's really funny. And then you see him present his work and you're like, wow, it's conceptual. It's unique. It's immediately identifiable. He's been doing it for years. He's a great writer. He's like a five-tool baseball player. He can do everything, hit for power, hit for average. He can field. He's got a great arm, all these different things. And you're like, wow, that's a guy to emulate. That's somebody who really takes his work seriously, but as a human being, he's really well-rounded. And I think being an interesting person is so much more important now than it was 30 years ago when I started, because now you have to be more than a photographer. There's a lot of people who can make acceptable work yeah. and clients are looking and saying, do I want to spend time around you? You know, do you have a sense of humor? Do you know about things outside of photography? Can you laugh at yourself? Boy, at that is so time? true, Dan. You know, can you be incredibly professional with the client, but then also turn around and, and break the ice and make people relax and, you know, make people uh, comfortable on set? All those different things that have nothing to do with photography, but are very, very important for being a photographer. Crack open a book on Picasso. David Douglas Duncan has uh, photographed him, photographed him for 25 years. And you, I highly recommend his book, uh, Viva, La, Viva, there's several, and one is Viva Picasso. And you get inside his world, he's a super fun-loving guy. He's always making jokes, or he's doing joke, con funny paintings, or putting on masks, or, you know, getting in s some, some sort of weird, uh, you know, masquerade thing. The guy loved fun. He was a fun-loving man. So, hey, by the way, we got to take a little side note here on our prayer. So somebody commented, you're not wearing glasses today. That's because when I was checking him out, he had his glasses on and they're all, see why he's not wearing glasses? It's a very practical thing. He probably, you know, there's no I other consideration. Now, somebody also noted they want to have my hat. What is that anyway? This, this is the second... Penny. Second person who wants my hat. Maybe I should start selling them. So we've been in a lockdown, but the hat is from a, a shop in Big Sur. You know what, guys? I may just get a line of uh, these hats so you can get them. Okay? Just stay tuned. I can't believe you don't already have that. I, well, I would have Jeez. by now, but again, they're shut down. You know, we've been in a lockdown. It is and true. That's a good, good reasoning for that. The main reason I wear this hat is if I took it off right now, you'd think I'm a homeless guy with a rabbit on the back of his head. So I cover it <laughs> with this hat, but it's sort of become part of my gig now. Do you have so, a mullet? Is that what you're admitting? I have right a mullet. Now? It's, mullet? it's yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. I'm almost, I almost have a mullet now. I, I'm I, getting there. It's so out of date and it's so out of style. I got to hide it between the, it is a, it looks like a dead rabbit on the back of my head. I think that's a better, better than a mullet. We're coming so we in. We just from, got someone. We got India. someone tuning in from a place I've never heard of, which is pretty, pretty great. It's Nagaland in Northeast India. Ra Chetri just, just uh, wrote that's, in. That's amazing. And India is one of those places. So I got asked to teach in India once, but it was literally fly to India from California, teach for like three days and then fly back. And I was like, no, I'm not doing Whoa, that. That's, that's, that's crazy. That India is, is like this, this jewel that I have been waiting for when I have endless time where I can travel slowly like on buses or on a bicycle or on foot and I can just go from one end of the country all the way to the other so at some point before I die I will be in India making pictures and taking notes and doing stories because India looks incredible and I've never heard of Nagaland so we'll be we'll go Ron. yeah Let's take advancing your photography to India. I'm, I'm actually really serious about that. If any of you guys have some connections there, let us know. And look, more people want to buy my hat. Okay. It's going to be. You should be doing. I'm going to be selling. Expeditions oh. In the Himalaya. Seriously. I might have passed my days for that, but. You look, know, I passed my days too. I'm not. I'm not going to see the summit of Everest anytime 20, soon. Twenty thousand feet base camp. You know what? Twenty thousand feet would just that. Twenty thousand feet. The the taxing of your body is just beyond uh, imagination. So I don't think I'm going to be and, doing that. And like, if I can't get Netflix, then I'm not going. Well, there you go. I mean, and you can't yeah. you, you can't post on Instagram from Everest. So forget about it. All right, let's take a couple more here. Hey. So Patu Duta, 
damn it, we want you over here in India. Well, we're, what are we waiting for? Come on. We got to we got to let the <laughs> we have to let COVID sort of work its way out. Then we can start planning India. I don't know about a workshop, but let's go, you know, with what we've got right now, okay? So all you guys in India, help me get over there. I'm serious. Go to AYP Club, and you guys make sure you're there, because I'm not kidding. I want – we have a, a, a decent audience in India. I was just looking at our demographics. But I want to build it, because from India came the most – amazing spiritual lessons that probably have have gone through our entire culture that's a whole other subject but yeah but that's deal. a great subject it's, it's a that's great a subject, subject that i that i'm fascinated by read about all the time and also let's not forget uh india also gave us ragu rai the magnum photographer who's the color street photographer from india who's fantastic amongst others there's all we, kinds we of we are great trying to get him we are trying i have been in touch with his people to try to get him on our channel and gandhi of course who inspired martin luther king who basically showed the world that you didn't have to fight evil with evil that you could actually change the world you could change they they freed themselves from bondage not by fighting evil but by turning it away and disarming it. Okay, that's another subject. I'm getting into my preacher mode here, which I can easily drop into. Let's take a couple of more questions, and I think we're out of here. So what do you guys, you got any last points you want to bring up? Or, Dan, yeah, have you shot, shot all your myths that we're going to shoot in this episode? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I was going to do a publishing okay. myth, but I'm going to skip that one. Yeah. Uh, well, but we've got a lot of resonance here on uh, on India, so make sure you guys. I want to make sure uh, Jared put up that AYP club place so that these guys can tie into it. Because I'm serious, we're taking this on the road. We're going east. It's east. You go to New York and you turn right. Okay. Yeah, so I'm looking for questions here, and there's a couple here. Let me just pick one. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Photo company sales pitch. We already got that one. Joel Sartori downgrading, moving to the pets professional space. That was pages. Um, yeah, so I think there's some questions. There's overall questions here about fine art, right? And this is, yeah. I was thinking about this on a bike ride the other day. The, and, and the reason I was thinking about this is I was on Taryn Simon's website. And she's like, she's incredible. And she, I believe, was an intern for uh, Gregory Crutzen who's another fine art person that you should know about and that that world. So just from those guys and also Michael Lundgren on his website, on his contact page, has a link, has links to probably 20 other artists that he likes or found influence from or et cetera. That I find really refreshing that he's willing to link out to these other people that shows you that he's, you know, uh, pretty secure in what he's doing. And, and he, he's a fascinating guy. But fine art is a is a peculiar thing. If you just Google fine art photography, you're probably not going to find any of these people. You might, but I don't think so. And Googling stuff like that, it's like a it's a pattern is too broad. Yeah. Um, but there's there are if you look at high end photo galleries and you look like Fahey Klein in Los Angeles or, um, you know, uh, Yossi Milo in New York or Frankel Gallery in San Francisco or. You look at photo exhibitions that have been done at museums and look at like the Tate Modern in London. That's a great place to start. And you look at some of the names on those photography exhibitions that will lead you into the fine art space. And it's endless. It's deep and it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and it's fascinating because that work to me, that's the India of photography like it's it's expansive you know yeah. india from top to bottom is many many different peoples and places and flavors and styles all in one country and i think that's what fine art photography is so that's how i would look for it well dan i think we've had enough fun for today is there anything you want to leave these guys with any final point that will hold them over until our next show yeah so I just did a book, not a review. I just did a second in my film series called Books I Love, which is a book called End of the Game by Peter Beard. And Peter Beard was the most single, most incredible journal keeper I've ever seen in my Check life. So this is my journal. Yeah. And my journal, journals. my journal pales in comparison to Peter Beard's journal. But my point is this 
should be an integral part of every photographer's life because this comes in handy in ways you can't imagine. It also makes you slow down, right? It's not typing. It's a pen on paper and it makes you think in a way long form. So get a journal. Don't need anything fancy. I do like the blurb journals, but you can use anything. Well, Dan, uh, brother, thanks again. It's been a thrill and it's always fun to be with you. So until next time, Take care. All right, buddy. We'll see you. Okay. See you soon. Thanks again. And hey, listen, on that on that note about journaling, I journal every day. Every one of my books, by the way, have started with a just a plain old journal that I started my ideas in there. You know, that's how, if you want to write a book, that's how you start. I am by by the way, I'm going to do a course on writing a book because there's a technology to it and there's a technique and there's a way that you approach it. Now, having shot myself in the foot and said, don't watch YouTube, don't turn this off. Okay. (laughs) My point is really that you, you know, you can go around with a little ice cream scoop in America. We have this thing called Baskin Robbins and they give you this tiny little scooper. It's about this big and it's got just enough to just barely taste the ice cream. And if you were to try to satisfy your urge for ice cream by just using those little plastic spoons, it's not going to be like the real deal. You want a full meal. Let's skip ice cream now. You want a full meal. And a full meal in photography comes from having an actual course, which I have created, by the way. I'm going to work with Dan to create one. But when you do the course, you got to go out and do the drills. You got to go out and actually you know, take photographs and share them. That's why we created the AYP Club. One of its main purposes is to bring you guys, keep you guys together. I loved seeing everybody, you know, on these chats and we put the AYP Club so we keep the conversation rolling and also where you guys can get critiqued. I mean, you heard me the other day, I told you how to critique a photograph. Okay, so other business Tomorrow, you guys, you've got to tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. We have Bambi Cantrell. I interviewed her many years ago. She's a fabulous portrait and wedding photographer, but she really talks about you got to know how to touch the spirit of the person that you're photographing. And she's got just ways of doing that that you're going to want to hear about tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Tune in for Bambi Cantrell. And then Friday, back with us again, are Bob and Andrea back from their wherever they've been, or maybe they're off again. I sort of lost track. They might be out in the world. You got to tune in. Okay. So these are big deals here. Um, We have some other shows coming up. We're going to post a calendar. Uh, so you guys can easily see who's coming up and what's going on. We got a lot of stuff going on at AYP. So, uh, Jared is working on getting a calendar posted. I need you guys in the AYP club and I need you participating. It's not a look. Photography is a sport. It's not a spectator sport. It's it's you get out there and you do it and you're going to learn from your mistakes. You're going to learn from other people. You're going to learn from critiques even if you don't like them it's good to hear feedback you might say f you i don't care what you think but at least you you can stand up to that if i learned one thing in art school it was the ability to say i don't really care what you're saying i think this is a good photograph and i'm going to move forward with what i'm going on because you're developing your own voice okay what else do we have here don't forget to support Bay Photo, and it's really supporting yourself. Get some prints made. I'm a huge believer in physical photography as the roots of photography, whether it's a book that you make like Dan was talking about or prints on your wall or whatever. Hey, they even made this for me, this backdrop. Kind of cool, right? So they'll make anything you want. Okay, guys, you know the drill from here. Help me spread the word about AYP. I'm serious, guys. I want to do a show with some photographers from India. I want to increase our audience in India. I believe in you guys. I I really want to expand there. 
I'm actually, I want to expand internationally even more. So wherever you are in the world, help me hook up with, photo you know, great photographers there. Help me, you know, connect with the audience. Anything you can think of, go to the AYP Club. You can leave me a comment there. Share. Hey, don't forget to <laughs> subscribe if you haven't already done that so you don't miss our shows. Leave your comments. Obviously, we, we've got a million of them here, but we want to hear from you guys offline as well and on the video when it gets posted. You can see what we're doing is we will post this again tomorrow, but we'll make a shorter version, usually under 10 minutes, that will come up in the next week or so. So you can stay tuned for that. And we're also releasing these as podcasts. Yes, they're going to be on, on Spotify, Apple, everywhere. So you can listen to them. Maybe you're out and about or you're driving or working out or whatever, and you want to be able to re-listen to one of these shows, you're going to be able to hear it as an audio podcast. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so that's about everything. I think you guys have gotten a lot of inspiration. I get inspired by hearing from you. I love your comments. I love seeing you from all over the world. So until next time, I love you guys. I really mean that. I'm not just saying that. I really do love you. And I want you to remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Take care. Stay well. See you guys soon.